There is a call that we need to walk in a newness of life. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television, a program designed to take you through the Bible in one year, from Genesis to Revelation. And today we're in the New Testament. I'm excited about today because in a minute, I'm going to be talking with you about we are called to walk in the newness of life. Now there's a choice. You can walk in sin or Jesus Christ. And the answer to the question is you must walk in Jesus Christ. So what does all of this mean? We'll talk about it in a minute. Corey, what are you talking about today? Today we're going to be taking a look at the first century history of the city of Rome as well as the history of the book of Romans itself. Very good. That is excellent. What did you study for? Well, today we're taking a look at Romans 8, a couple of verses there that specifically deal with adoption. Adoption, really, in the spirit of adoption. That's amazing. There's lots that we've studied for on this program. It's a great program. So I want to encourage you to get your Bible out and get your Bible guide out because we're going to study together. It is time right now. Corey's around the corner with Bible history and archaeology. Corey? First step in our historical studies today, we are going to be taking a look at the city of Rome, so the capital city of the Roman Empire. Now, we're going to focus in on the history in the first century AD because that's when the Book of Romans was written. In the first century AD, the city of Rome had a flourishing Christian population. This is the group of believers to whom Paul wrote the Book of Romans. His purpose in writing was to strengthen their faith, a strengthening that would become all too necessary with Emperor Nero's descent into madness. The city of Rome was originally founded in the 8th century BC on Palatine Hill, but it quickly grew to encompass six other surrounding hills. Rome went through the stages of being a monarchy with kings and royalty, a republic with elected consuls and a senate, and finally, an empire marked by the first ruling emperor, Caesar Augustus, who is also mentioned as the reigning emperor when Christ was born. Today, Rome's most popular landmark by far is the still-standing giant amphitheater, the Colosseum. But the New Testament Church of Rome lived a few decades before this was built. Instead, they would have been familiar with the Circus Maximus, a chariot racetrack that could seat 60,000 Romans. Caesar Augustus also had built many elaborate public buildings, temples, and monuments to beautify the city while adding lasting fame to his own name. The population of Rome during the first century was around a million people, including hundreds of thousands of slaves. Wealthy citizens lived in villas and estates built in ancient suburbs, while commoners lived in Rome's version of the apartment building. The New Testament Church of Rome experienced great changes under Emperor Nero's reign. After a devastating fire swept the city in AD 64, the emperor began a seek-and-destroy policy towards Christians, one that aimed to provide Rome with an enemy they could see. Nero publicly tortured and executed Roman Christians, including both apostles Peter and his wife, and Paul. From a historical perspective, the fact that there was enough Christians in Rome for Paul to actually write a letter to the church in Rome is pretty astounding. It was a pretty pagan place. Now, what's funny about me saying that it was a pretty pagan place is that the non-Christian Romans at the time actually called Christians atheists. And that's simply because Christians rejected the concept of a wide pantheon of many gods, these Greek and Roman gods that were kind of blended together. And instead, they served only one god. Now, Christians were also ridiculed from Romans and, and, and from the broader Roman Empire for following someone, and by someone I mean Jesus Christ, uh, uh, because he was crucified. Now, being crucified was the lowest death 
of them all. It was reserved for criminals and traitors of Rome. So the fact that Christians worshiped Jesus as the Messiah, as God himself, was absolutely ridiculous uh, to uh, Romans who believed in the pantheon. It was just a shameful thing. Gods were amazing and they had uh, human characteristics, but they were honorable somehow. They had great power. They would never lower themselves to, to allow to be crucified. So uh, Christians earned a reputation as these laughingstock people because they followed a humble king who chose love over anger. We are not born a certain way. Sin makes us that way. God did not create us for sin or to fall. Sin invades our lives to make its presence known. This is what it says in the Bible. We must understand as wise guys that we are enemies of God until we take Jesus Christ as the Lord of our lives. When that happens, sin no longer rules in our lives and the reign goes to Jesus Christ. In fact, our rights as we know them are really not our rights, but the rights of Jesus Christ and what he gives us. This is our new mode of thinking. When we come to Jesus Christ, we give our lives to him. Wise guys understand and make this true in their lives. Romans 6, verses 1 through 14. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Baptism is important. You have just heard Romans chapter six, and, and it's amazing how God speaks through the individual chapters as he speaks to us through the word of God. Over 1,100 chapters, and this one is significant. See, Romans chapter six tells us something very important. Paul speaks to the church. Paul talks to the church. 
And he says, now I need to explain some things to you about baptism. I need to explain some things to you so you can understand how to act and react properly. And remember, Paul is writing to the church at Rome. It's in the capital city of the empire, and it's very important. Now, there's a Bible guide that has four points in it, and the four points are important. And those points are interesting. And, and Paul actually says here that we need to walk in the newness of faith. And we're going to cover three of those four points today. And as we deal with this, I want to pray and ask the Lord to show us exactly what God desires us to hear. Because God is speaking to us today, and as we go through the Bible, we'll learn that the Holy Spirit moves in our hearts, and the Holy Spirit may move in your heart in a very special way. So I want to invite you, if you don't get a Bible guide, write to us and send an offering in any amount. We'll be happy to send it to you. Wisdom in the newness. In the newness. What does that mean, the divine wisdom? In the newness of life. And as we begin to talk about that, we're reading from Romans chapter 6 to 10, and that keeps us up with going through the Bible in one year. And our focus today is on Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 14. Now, as we read this and understand it, we need to understand God is speaking. Lord, what do you want us to know? Well, we go to Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, and we learn something. The Bible says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us, as we're baptized in Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should be walking in the newness of life. Wow, that's interesting. And so we go to the point. We are called, beloved, to walk in the newness of life instead of the oldness of sin. You know, it's amazing to me how many people I talk to, and they say to me all the time, well, you know, I'm stuck in this lifestyle because I was born that way and God made me that way. And they go on and on and, and they talk about all this foolishness. And I say one thing that you haven't really understood. That is the power of the Holy Spirit when Jesus Christ comes into your life. It is possible, is possible, beloved, for you to walk right with God and for you to avoid the sin. And that's called sanctification. There is, of course, the miracle moment of salvation, and that's great, and you come to know Jesus Christ, but it, it really doesn't stop there. That's the beginning. And the newness of life is, of course, the sanctification, which is an entire lifetime of God helping you to become holy. God is interested in you becoming holy. See, people come to Jesus Christ and they often say, well, God wants me to be happy. Actually, God wants you to be holy first because you can't really be happy unless you're holy. And so God begins to work in your life. But some people put that off. Don't put that off, beloved. Say, yes, Lord, I can do this. I can change my lifestyle. I can make a difference. Do it. God will help you. Believe me. All right, we go back to the scripture and we learn in Romans, or, uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 5 and 8. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. And that brings me to this point as we look at it. We are called to live under God's supervision. Under God's supervision. And there are those who choose to walk in the darkness because they cannot see the power of God reigning over it. Beloved, I want to tell you something. If you can't see the power of God, then you need to pray and come to Jesus Christ. I, I want to tell you something. The power of the Holy Spirit is remarkable. I mean, if you're an adulterer and you're somebody who goes after women all the time or, or you're a woman who gets stuck in relationships all the time, you come to Jesus Christ and get yourself free 
God will change you and you will see what I'm talking about. Very important. We go back to the scripture in Romans chapter 6, verses 8 through 11. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin for once and all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but to be alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, it's important that we understand we are called to live in Jesus Christ because he went before us and he lived the example. This is so great because I, I like to tell people, you know, they're oftentimes they're defeated and, and they're feeling bad. And, you know, I didn't do this right or I didn't do that right. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ gives you newness of life. And Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God in three persons, that Holy Spirit will come into your life and totally change you. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ to touch the people as they come to you and they know you, they want to live in life. Help them, Father, to overcome sin. study and read through the book of Romans, this is the perfect place and the perfect time to conduct a study on the book of Romans in general. So the history of the book, how it was written, who it was written to, why it was written, how it was transmitted, all of these questions we're going to take a little bit of a deeper look into right now. 21 of the 27 New Testament books are letters, and the Apostle Paul wrote at least 13 of these. While letter writing was not a traditional means of religious exhortation, it served the men of Christ well. They were able to transfer solid theology quickly and across the distances of the empire of Rome, all the while maintaining their own individual teaching styles. They were able, via letters, to unify Christian communities under the original intention of Christ's teaching. It is known from the letters of Paul that he used amanuenses, meaning a trained scribe or secretary, to pen his letters as he dictated. Romans 16 verse 22 has Paul's scribe Tertius greeting the readers of the letter as the man who physically penned Romans for Paul. Nevertheless, we do see from Paul's other New Testament letters that he often took up the pen himself to write the final greeting in his own hand. We can assume as his signature of approval after checking and approving the work of his amanuenses. The Book of Romans is believed to have been written by Paul and Tertius close to AD 57, likely during a stay in the city of Corinth. In the letter, Paul explained that he was on his way to Jerusalem, bringing financial support from the Gentile churches, but that he next planned on traveling to Rome and then Spain. According to the book of Acts, Paul's plans were forced to change. During his Jerusalem stay, Paul was arrested on phony charges of desecrating the temple. He was taken to Caesarea, where he was imprisoned for two years. After his appeal to Caesar, Paul was lawfully and intentionally moved to Rome, where he would finally have a chance to meet and teach the Roman Christians. Most people don't know it, but they think they do. Most people do not read it, but often quote it incorrectly. Most people don't know the Bible. Christians are often called Bible believers, but they don't read the Bible. Are you a believer? 
Do you know your Bible? Join us at Quick Study as we explore the passages of hope that lead us into the life of believing in a God of the universe. We present the Quick Study Bible Guide every month for reading every day to complete the whole Bible in one year. Even if you get behind and don't have the time to catch up, you can still present the Word of God to yourself with the Bible Guide. Write today for the 32-page guide sent automatically every month to anyone who chooses to give any amount. Join with the thousands of people who have discovered the Bible by learning it through the Quick Study Bible Guide. Thank you for joining us on Quick Study Television as we continue to go through the Bible in one year. It's very exciting, by the way, and we're going through the New Testament, and this is amazing. Mm -hmm. Now, next time on the Quick Study Television program, notice I'm going to be talking about this. There's a remnant who believe in Jesus Christ. And this is interesting because this is Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, according to the Bible. That's what the Bible says. I believe the Bible, this program believes the Bible, and we're gonna talk about that on the next program of Quick Study Television. Very interesting. And Janice, what ah. did you study for today? Well, we are talking about Romans 8 today. We're reading 6 through 10, and I decided to land in Romans 8 because there's a couple of verses there in 15 and 23 that Paul refers to adoption in some way. Now in 8.15 it says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Secondly, Paul talks, it will begin in verse 22 of Romans 8, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. I wanted to take a look at adoption in these Roman times. And according to Manners and Customs of the Bible by James M. Freeman, among the Greeks and the Romans, when a man had no son, he could choose to adopt one, even though not related. He could adopt one of his servants as a son if he wanted. Now the adopted son took the name of the father and was in every respect regarded and treated as a son. Now among the Romans of this time, there were two parts to the act of adoption. Number one, there was a private arrangement between the parties. So the man wanting to adopt the son, this was done privately within the family. Number two, there was a formal and public declaration of the fact. Two very important steps of the adoption. Now, it's thought by some that the first of this, the private arrangement between the parties, is referred to in the first verse. Romans 8, 15. And the second part, a formal public declaration of the fact, is what Paul is talking about in Romans 8, 23, where the apostle speaks of waiting for the adoption. The servant has been adopted privately, but now he is waiting for the public declaration of the fact. And this shows an amazing similarity in verse 22 and 23. Now, after the adoption, the son, no longer a slave, had the privilege of addressing his former master by the title of father. This he had no right to do while he was still a servant. So if you take that and apply it to we who yes. have accepted and been adopted by God the Father, this just takes on a whole deeper meaning when we read Romans 8. It does because there's a private uh, time when you pray to God. That's right. And that's a decision we make. That's right. You know, we're going to pray to God and we're going to say, Abba, Father. Yes. And then there is a public declaration where we say that to everyone. That's right. And we're waiting for that. Not only that, but we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. And so this is really, really interesting. And I wanted to uh, make sure that we knew that because there may be some people 
who are watching this program right now and you have not done that. And I want to invite you to come to Jesus Christ. I, I want you to adopt God the Father because he has made provision for you. He has made ready the adoption for you. He is waiting for you. Jesus Christ waits today. Come to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I believe that you died on the cross. And I believe that 2,000 years ago, three days after you died, that you were raised from the dead. And I understand who you are. You are the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray, be my Lord today, and I will be your servant. If you prayed that prayer and you're serious, God will move. We grow wise when we understand that God saves us through Jesus Christ our Lord. We must understand that God is the one who planned our life against sin and works righteousness in His power through Jesus Christ for us. We grow wise when we choose to take the power of God in our lives and let it grow. Every time we avoid sin, it is a defeat for Satan and his work. It is difficult, but it is real and it's true. We win our lives by letting Jesus Christ have the times and the places that we are in, that he needs for success. We must choose Christ Jesus. I love when Jesus Christ comes to me and he says, Rod, I'm here. You've forgotten about me and there have been times in my life when I have. And let me tell you something, if you forgot about Jesus Christ, time to come home today and time to re-surrender your life to him. Come to Jesus and say, Lord, I've, I, I've messed up. I, I ask for your help. And in Jesus' name, please come into my life and forgive me of my sin. I give my life to you and I believe you rose from the dead. In Jesus' name, amen.